You have a paper uh, on evolutionary stalling where you describe that evolution is not good at multitasking or like uh, in uh, populations that evolve quickly. I mean, it's a very specific thing, but th there could be a generalizable fundamental thing to this that evolution is not able to improve multiple modules sim simultaneously. Uh, I guess the question is, um, what part of the organism does evolution quote unquote focus on to improve? Mm. Yeah, that was the driving question. We um, meddled with the part where you shouldn't be messing up with translation. This is the... Should or should not? You shouldn't. Uh, as I said, there are many ways to break it, and uh, all life needs it. That's so one of the thing f your favorite things to do is to break life to see what happens. It's, uh, yeah, because that's how kids learn, right? So you have to break something and yeah. then see how it will... Then you do it over and over again to see if it will fix itself in the same ways. Yeah. So that's the, it's our, I don't know, it's the most fundamental properties of our ourselves as human beings. So if we shouldn't break translation, then we should try to break it yes. to see how it will repair. So which part did you break? I broke elongation. So uh, what, what, well, what's the role of elongation in this process? So the, we, we have uh, four steps of the, of the translation to initiate, elongate. So you elongate the chain of the, the, the information chain that you're now creating, the mm -hmm. peptide chain, uh, uh, or let's say broadly polymer chain. Um, and there's a termination step and there's the recycling. So all of these com uh, steps are carried out by proteins that are also named after these steps, initiation, is the initiation factor protein elongation is the elong elongator protein. Um, we um, broke elongation, so the cell, the starting codon, could still arrive to where it's supposed to go, but the following information couldn't get carried out because we replaced elongation with uh, its own ancestral version. So we inserted roughly a 700 million year old elongation factor protein after removing the modern gene. So we made this ancient modern hybrid organism. And that essentially creates in some way the ancient version of that organism. I wouldn't say so. It's the it's a it's a hybrid organism. It's not necessarily because you the rest of this cell, the rest of the uh genome is still modern. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to the difference between Jurassic Park. There are many differences, obviously, given that this is not fiction, we're doing it. But also, um, we are not necessarily, I think in Jurassic Park, they are taking an ancient, or they find an ancient organism and then put a modern gene inside the ancient organism. Mm -hmm. In our case, we are still working with what we got, but putting an ancestral DNA inside the modern organism. So you're like taking a new car and putting an old engine into it. In a way, yeah, yes. And seeing what happens. Yes, in, but in our case, it's more like a transformer than just a regular car. It is doing things. <laughs> it's Yeah, so it's a more complicated organism than just a car. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I got it. So what, is that, what does that teach you? We, we wanted to understand multiple things. One is the, how does the cell respond to perturbation? And we didn't just put the ancient DNA. We inserted, um, we sampled DNA from currently existing organisms, so the cousins of this microbe, mm -hmm. uh, and, and collected DNA sequences from the cousins as well. So both ancestor and the current cousin DNA, so to speak, and engineered all of these things to the modern bacteria and generated a collection of microbes uh, that either have the ancient component or the variant uh, elongator component that still alive today, but coming from a different part of the tree. So you broke elongation. Was that something you did uh, as part of the paper on evolutionary stalling to try to figure out how evolution figures out what to try to improve? Did that help? Yes, be because we were not supposed to mess with the translation. That's exactly what we did. Mm -hmm. And we altered elongation by changing it with different versions of elongation that are either coming from species that still are around today. Uh, you can imagine them as sitting on the tips of the tree near branch, far branch, to uh, compare to the organism that we're working with, cousins, distant cousins. 
as well as the ancestors of the bacteria that uh, we are now modifying. How much different uh, variation is there in that elongation step? Like what, what are the different flavors of elongation? That's a very good question. So mechanistically or me mechanically, it's the same. It's it's very conserved. So all life elongates the same way. You are, it's nothing but a shuttle. You just carry an, um, the chemical with you, the, the bit to the heart of the machine. Is that essentially doing like a copy paste operation? It has its tail that's attached to the the uh, code, which is then carried uh, biochemically to the linear chain to the core of ribosome, and the and it sits on there. It releases and the peptides click uh, the the codes rather click once that chemistry that is at the tail end occurs. The protein leaves the um, center. So it, you can imagine it's like it hops in there and hops out. Mm -hmm. And when it hops and hops out, it leaves the information behind. That's all it does is bring the information, get out of there. And it's all triggered by um, biophysics, biochemistry, because of the way the enzyme chews energy, in this case, GTP, how the, uh, the phosphor leaves the center that kicks, that gives the, the additional kick um, to the enzyme to leave the center. So what, which parts are different then? Where's the flavors of it's, different flavors so usually, of elongation? Usually the parts that matter don't change over time. Nature conserves the sites of these proteins that are important for its job. Uh, if there's a difference, then we, we want to know, especially if, if there's a difference between two cousins. And in, we look at the sites uh, that interact with the most important parts of this machinery, if we see any difference, we tend to mutate or we revert, we, we engineer that part, we alter that part because it gives us a clue that there must be something interesting going on here or not. Okay, so that's not the the fundamental part of the machinery, but it's some flavorful characteristic that you can play with. So now you stripped the machinery down to its parts and now you are looking at the parts of the parts. Okay. And um, it depends uh, where you're looking and how you're looking and what you're looking at. But usually we see uh, up to 70% level uh, conserved identity across all modern uh, versions. When you travel back in time, uh, the identity decreases. So elongation likely existed. Uh, we have good reason to think that it existed at the dawn of life. So you're looking at a 3.8 billion year old mechanism. Um, and when we look at the ancestors that we resurrect, we see about 40% uh, identity. So the identity definitely decreases as you go back in time, but still 60% shared information over 4 billion year is, is pretty good. Is that just for elongation or for the entire translation? Depends mechanism? on what you do. So for uh, initiation, we've also recently published this. It's a different uh, story, uh, but overall you see high level of um, identity that that is kept intact, especially if the component is essential for life. Okay, so forty percent and sixty seventy percent you said, but like from generation to generation, how does evolution? And presumably, that's what that paper is looking at is the parts of the parts. Yeah. How does so? How, how does it uh, able to say like mess with the parts and try to come up with a cooler, improved? version of the organism. Yeah, so let me describe to you what we did in that experiment. We took a, a different, uh, we took bacteria, we perturbed the elongation in all of these with mm -hmm. different variants. So we had an initial set of, um, a group of bacteria that we had. We then subjected these bacteria to evolution in the lab, right? So we, uh, first of all, we knew we broke it because upon engineering, we measured what's going on with the cell. It's not growing as well. They're not healthy. We can see it with our eyes. We can measure it. That if they were generating an offspring every 20 minutes, now it is 40 minutes, mm -hmm. right? So we really messed them up. They don't want to work with this thing. They don't want each other, but they need each other. So we created that situation for them, mm -hmm. which is good because we want uh, to see how, uh, we wanted to see how they will uh, cooperate with each other uh, to fix this problem because we know that that's not the condition that they want to live in, especially when they know what they can do. So with that, we subjected these organisms to evolution in the lab. That's, uh, we refer to this as experimental evolution. We subject bacteria to different selection pressure, uh, 
project them through bottlenecks. Every day we randomly collect a handful of bacteria from the flask, give them, put them in a new fresh environment with fresh food, keep them in this environment for 24 hours until they reach a more dormant state, and then we subject uh, introduce them to a new environment. So we re- repeated this for about, it, um, I will say, 150 days. So every day, uh, not nonstop, we repeated this experiment. Some kind of, uh, how much, ch- uh, how many different kinds of environments are there? We we kept the environments to the same and because we had different initial conditions. We kept the environment constant, same temperature, same food, same source of carbon, uh, but we uh, created replicates for each uh, uh, lineage. So in some ways, we created our own fossil record mm-hmm. in the lab by evolving and generating these flasks. And every gen- every step of the way, we also froze these cells uh, and took stocks of them in the in the cryo freezer. How long does it take to go from one generation to the next with bacteria? If you, uh, for E. coli, it's usually 20 minutes. Okay, great. So that's the experiment. That's the experiment. And, and you're... You're always messing it with it in the same way for the initial. It's the it's the condition. same way. So we we introduce variation at the elongation level because so because we um, perturbed it with different elongations. We found that if we introduce a different protein that is very different, the cells don't like that, right? So if the distance is larger, the consequence is also large, meaning that you hit them harder if you introduce a variant that is really foreign to them, that's really distant. In, in our case, it was the ancestor. They really did not like the ancestor, but they were okay with their nearest cousin. <laughs> right. Okay, great. So you did vary in the distance. We varied at the dis- evolutionary distance, and then we distance. kept the experiment co- experimental conditions the same, and we propagated these populations every day for 150 days, and we collected um, bacteria at every step of the way and looked at the sequence. We wanted to understand what sort of changes may have happened in the genome to respond to uh, the variation that we've introduced. So what kind of changes are you, would you be seeing depending on the evolutionary distance of the thing you shoved into it? Exactly, so we knew where we punched, right? We punched right at the heart. Right, we punched the translation. So we expected, is it going to be is a translation? Are we going to see a change? That will translation respond to this by fixing itself right away? Mm-hmm. Or will it be um, another uh, outside of translation, something completely different, a different module? Because translation itself is a module. Uh, or will it be within elongation, a really sub-protein level thing? So we uh, had a strategy to un- identify uh, the mutational pathways by categorizing what we expected to find or where. Okay, so why does it not do multitasking? <laughs> why is it <laughs> not a, improving multiple things at the same, why? simultaneously? It turned out that what we observed in general is that, first of all, the harder we hit the cells, the more likely they were to respond by changes right at where we hit it. When you say hit it, you mean like change the, something about the I like the to think of it as hitting because we are, so I like to think of this as breaking the cell, right? I mean, not breaking enough to kill it, but we still, because they're still alive, they're not doing their job well. So the, the, the bigger the evolutionary distance of the thing you put in there, the the the, the harder the hit is how you exactly. think about it. The bigger the hammer. Bigger the hammer, hit, exactly. Do you hit it with, okay. It, that's what it turned out to be because that's what the data told us, that if we... Um, if the variation is higher, then the uh, consequences will also be higher in the sense that the cells will not grow as healthy compared to a, a variant that is coming from a near uh, or a variant that is coming from a near evolutionary distance. Uh, is it is it wrong to think of this kind of hitting as a, um, akin to a mutation or no? What are we supposed to learn from this hitting? Like how, how the thing evolves after it's it's being hit in this way. What does that teach us? Because we we see translation machinery as almost um, it is so conserved and so essential. It is not even clear whether we can remove some of the parts or whether the entire translation will need all of the same parts in the same efficiency. Mm-hmm. We don't understand the rules of this machinery. So the first thing we all understand is that how what is the resilience? What are we really talking about Got here it. when we talk about you cannot mess with this translation? Is this true? 
because it is so conserved and so similar and functions in the most conserved ways, uh, that was the first thing that we wanted to understand. Did, did you learn anything interesting about the resilience at the chemical, physical, informatic computation? No, I, I wouldn't say that. I think the biological level, yes, because we found that the different modules started responding to the changes that we've introduced and that we could never recover the translation as effectively as it used to be. So that it never reached to it is um, uh, optimality, that it was always suboptimal. It, it needed, say, one more mutation perhaps to get there. It, it accumulated four mutations that was, we did a lot of experiments to understand this, of course. It was accumulating mutations. It was getting better at its task. Maybe it needed a couple other mutations to get really good at it, but somehow those mutations never happened. And before those mutations happened, we saw another module um, emerging through mutations and getting better at its own different task that is not translation. You can think of cell as a web of networks, right? Uh, and we think of these as multiple almost airports that are proteins that are more central hubs versus there are proteins that maybe are not as important hub. If you introduce a problem in the most populated hub, you're going to mess up the traffic system more drastically. And and that's what we were messing with in, in the biological terms as well. So when we say module, like translation would be one of the modules. Translation would be one. So you're basically saying when you mess with translation, the organism would choose to either try to fix that module or another module, depending. Exactly. But it wouldn't do multiple modules. It wouldn't do multiple modules. It focused on one module at a time. And right before that module maybe reached to its own maximum, it stalled its uh, optimality at a certain degree. So you never get to a degree that is more optimal uh, than you can achieve, even though perhaps another mutation could get you there. Since you messed with the translation, from a sort of optimal perspective, wouldn't it make sense for the cell to try to start fixing the translation? Not that's exactly what we thought, and it didn't. It was not the case for all the broken translation machineries. For instance, if the variant was coming from a near ancestor, that didn't happen. It was almost cruising around, trying different modules, and sort of living its best life still, without uh, because there is no real urgency in the system to fix the most important problem. And there's perhaps. also not a direction. You know, maybe to you it's obvious that's the problem, but to the cell. Maybe you're the problem. I'm living, like you said, my best life. Like we don't, I mean, I guess that's the thing about evolution is we don't know what the right direction to. Yeah, it's almost is. like the, you can imagine that you have this me messy closet and, um, you know, you Go can. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> happens to be an accurate <laughs> representation and, and, of my life. So but you, I can, you can, you, you take a look at it and you see all this sweaters or, you know, yeah. jeans or all over the place. And then you look at a drawer that has socks coming out of it and you think that's the most important one, I'm just gonna fix that one. Yeah. And then you fix that one. And then you think you will get to the other one, but you don't because you just fix the most important one. That is the, whatever that was getting into your way. That's really what evolution is. It's quite lazy. It fixes the problem that seems to be the most immediate and it doesn't go beyond what it really needs to. It seems like at least for our experimental setup, that was the case. Uh, especially for rapidly evolving systems. So like, or is the environment they're operating in pretty constrained? Like, is there a urgency? I would, I would, th I would say that we definitely constrain the environment. It's definitely removed from their natural s s setup. We are not evolving them in a gut. It's a very homogeneous system, very controlled, controlled temperature, controlled food, controlled carbon.